Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Our whole sales tax system uh, is, is one of the worst in the country. No tax holiday this weekend? The problems with how we collect sales tax. Now it's every applicant will, will get 100% reimbursement. Great news this week for Louisiana flood victims. It's an effort to really look at data at the state and local levels. How Louisiana takes care of its kids. That was the signature storm for Louisiana. The last island hurricane of 1856. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But right now, a look at some of the other headlines making news across Louisiana. An aggressive campaign is ramping up to educate Louisiana voters about a proposed constitutional amendment that will be decided this fall, potentially reversing a Jim Crow era law that allows felony convictions without unanimous agreement from jurors. The state is one of only two that allows so-called split jury verdicts in felony trials. Here, a person can be convicted of a felony if just 10 of 12 jurors agree that a defendant is guilty. The U.S. Senate passed a short-term extension of the federal flood insurance program, sending it to President Trump for his signature just hours before an August 1st deadline. The 86 to 12 vote preserves access to flood insurance for U.S. homeowners, but it again punts on reforms to a program that now covers more than 5 million households and collects more than $3 billion in premiums yearly. The bill extends the authorization for the program and its ability to borrow money through November 30th. Governor John Bell Edwards has announced Stevenson Technologies Corp., LSU's Applied Research Center, has secured a $10 million federal contract to strengthen the cybersecurity of small businesses that work with manufacturers in Louisiana. The award comes from the U.S. Department of Defense's Air Force Research Lab. LED Secretary Don Pearson became an honorary life member of the Southern Economic Development Council this week. It's the largest and oldest regional economic development organization in North America. The University of Louisiana at Lafayette plans to open a policy center next year in honor of former Governor Kathleen Blanco. The Kathleen Babineau Blanco Public Policy Center will focus on public policy issues the governor worked on during her career. The state's hazing penalties will toughen, the marriage waiting period will shorten, and the types of records shielded from public view will grow as more than 430 new laws took effect this week. Lawmakers passed the measures during the regular legislative session that ended in May, and they were signed into law by the governor. We are approaching the two-year anniversary of the August 2016 floods that impacted so many people in 21 parishes covering much of South Louisiana. Remember, of course, two huge flood events in 2016 that impacted 56 parishes and the people living in those. So many people still trying to recover. The work to help Rose Recover is Restore Louisiana, and their work is never done. But Pat Forbes is the executive director, and you're at the center of that work. So you're the person that people turn to all the time. And one thing that is happening big this week is that checks are going out in the mail that will make a big difference. Tell us about that. That's right, Andre. Um, in July, the governor asked the Restore Louisiana Task Force to look at the opportunity to increase what to date has been a 50% reimbursement for work that was done before we got there. 
Um, and that was a, a budgetary concern that we had initially, but it looks like the funding is adequate. And so the governor said, go look at going to 100%. So 100% funding now. That's right. That's right. Up up until this point, only a few folks uh, low to moderate income with who with somebody elderly or uh, handicapped in their home um, was eligible for 100 percent. Now it's every applicant will will get 100 percent reimbursement for the eligible expenses. How many people are we talking about here? Well, uh, in the end, it will be over 10,000 families, uh, over $110 million, most likely. But just this week, uh, we will be processing additional checks to everyone who has so far received the 50% reimbursement to bring that reimbursement up to 100%. That's gonna be over 4,600 happy families this week. Uh, they'll probably be getting the letters over the next two weeks, the checks. Is there a limit to when that money would run out? Nope. Uh, the funding, the reason we're able to do this is because we've established that we've got adequate funding to uh, cover the increase from 50 to 100 percent. Something else very timely is the status of the SBA duplication of benefits and where that stands with all the political uh, governmental red tape that that's going to take to happen. Sure. Great question. Uh, because it's really tied to this 100% reimbursement. A lot of folks who have the SBA loans and the duplication of benefits are uh, worried that our funding of this 100% reimbursement is somehow gonna affect their ability to get paid if we get that fixed, but that's not the case. We also have adequate funding to do the SBA fix as well as the 100% reimbursement. Um, where the SBA fix is, is a, a version written by Congressman Graves has made its way out of the House of Representatives to the Senate where they're considering it. It would wipe out all SBA loans, whether approved, I mean, whether accepted, not accepted, drawn, not drawn. Uh, it would eliminate them as a duplication of benefits for our program. Our experience in disaster relief gives us the ability to fast track some of these yeah. items, which it's never fast enough if you're stuck in the middle of it, right. but it is faster than a lot of other states. You're right. Unfortunately, we have been hit by a lot of disasters, as everybody knows, and it has given us a world of experience. It makes us better able to react quickly and get the things in that we have to do. Uh, we're glad that we have that capability. We're just not so happy about the yeah, reason. <laughs> but the fact that it happened. I want to ask you uh, quickly about the survey deadline that has passed, but the application, if you've done the survey and you're still doing the application, that deadline has not passed, but it will at some point. That's correct. So we set a deadline of July 20th for the survey applications. That's over. If you haven't completed the survey by now, it's too late. Um, we have not yet set the deadline for the applications, but it will be this fall. And if you have been invited by Restore Program to complete that application, I would implore you to do so because we have the funding available to provide assistance and we, the people we've invited to apply are very likely to be eligible. So hard to believe that two years later, so many people are dealing with this not even back in their homes, uh, amazingly, but, uh, but if you're in the middle of it, then you know how difficult it is and you know that firsthand. Yep, there are uh, lots of folks out there. I mean, we, we're glad that we have been able to make this program run so fast, get up and running so fast, but that doesn't make any difference in the world to somebody who's not back in their home. And Absolutely. those are the people we're working for every day to make sure that the earliest possible date we can have them back in their homes. Try to cut through as much red tape as possible. We're Pat, trying. Thank you always. Thanks, Andre. For more information about flood recovery, check out restore.la.gov. A federal grant announced this week will allow about 4,500 kids from low-income Louisiana households to attend high-quality early child care education programs. Now, 4,500 may seem like a small number, but LPB's Kelly Spires is here to explain why it can make such a big impact. 
That's right. Andre, Louisiana recently scored poorly on a national report that looks at child well-being, but advocates say early education is a key way to improve those measures. 49th overall, 50th in economic well-being, 47th in education, and 44th in health. Every year, the Annie E. Casey Foundation compiles measurements of childhood well-being in a report called Kids Count. Teresa Falgu heads the project at Agenda for Children, the Louisiana nonprofit that helps the count here. It's an effort to really look at data at the state and local levels to see how well children are doing across age ranges and across different domains of child well-being. So it looks at everything from the percentage of low birth weight babies all the way up through the percentage of young people who are graduating from high school on time. Louisiana is one of three states where economic rankings have dropped since 2010. And that's based on things like the child poverty rate, the percentage of um, children who live in families where parents have full-time year-round employment, as well as the percentage of young people who are neither in school nor working, and the number of kids who are um, in families with a high housing cost burden. Our state's education rankings have improved, some of the largest improvements of any state, but we're still far behind. 8% more fourth graders are proficient readers than in 2010, but 74% are still not reading at a proficient level. And that's really critical because at fourth grade, kids are making that transition from learning to read to reading to learn. If you're not a proficient reader by fourth grade, you're really at a high risk of um, struggling later in school, including being at a higher risk of dropout. So the trend's moving in the right direction. But we're really also still continuing to see these huge differences between performance of higher income kids and lower income kids. Health indicators were the state's strong suit. And one of the drivers there is our really amazing rate of the percentage of kids who are uninsured. Um, we have seen that rate decline from 6% in 2010 down to 3% in 2016, which means 97% of Louisiana kids are um, covered by some form of health insurance. Falgu says that economic number has to be improved and that other indicators will rise with it. Kids are most likely to experience poverty when they're youngest, when they're most vulnerable to the negative effects of poverty. Um, so if you ask me what one thing could we do to improve child well-being in Louisiana, I would say focus on that child poverty rate and really try to get more parents connected to high quality jobs. Even though almost 30 percent of children live in poverty, two thirds of children birth through age four have both parents in the workforce. Kids Count says 35 percent of children have parents who lack secure income. Melanie Bronfin is with the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children. Her group recently studied how limited access to child care affects the state's economy. Our data showed they're getting fired, they're missing work, there's turnover rates. It actually costs Louisiana employers over $800 million a year because of child care breakdowns of their workers. If parents can get back to work and children can be in quality child care programs, it could be a two-generation solution to Louisiana's poverty problems, Bronfin says. The science is clear now that the brain is built from the bottom up and 80% of brain development happens birth through age three. She says 40% of children are starting kindergarten behind. The reason we have so many children starting behind, it's very obvious, we invest less than, as a state, one half of 1% of our state general funds on early care and education. So you reap what you sow. If the state doesn't invest early, it spends more later. If a child starts kindergarten behind, she is more likely to end up needing extra attention in the education system. And then is more likely to end up in being held back a grade. And then is more likely to not graduate um, on time or at all. And then is more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. So the investment, the cost that we spend on the back end is so great. The state's policy choices have not reflected that research. It's only 15 percent of children birth to three can access any publicly funded program. And in fact, as I was saying, the only program that we have, the Child Care Assistance Program, we have cut that from serving almost 40,000 kids 10 years ago to 15,000 kids today. And we have a waiting list of over 5,000 kids to get into that program. The situation is brighter for four-year-olds. 
we are doing a good job actually at serving our at-risk four-year-olds. We have a great pre-K program, high quality, and almost 90% of our at-risk four-year-olds can access, it's voluntary, but can access if they choose a pre-K program across the state. And the legislature agreed to create a plan to make early care and education more accessible. It can be unaffordable even for middle class families. That's going to be a huge amount of money, so we're not going to achieve it tomorrow. But you won't ever get there if you don't say, okay, let's start in increase by 20% the number of kids who can access, and then 20%, and then 20%. And then, step by step, maybe we'll see Louisiana advance in the rankings. Next week, we'll have a visit with State Superintendent of Schools, John White. All right, look forward to that, Kelly. Thanks so much. Well, this weekend was supposed to be the time for parents to get a little discount on school supplies for the upcoming year. No state sales tax. But when lawmakers finalized the budget, they accidentally got rid of sales tax free weekend. So Kelly, what now? Well, Andre, lawmakers could bring a bill next year to bring these tax free weekends back. We spoke with Robert Travis Scott from the Public Affairs Research Council, though, about some other reforms that are more pressing. Can you tell us why we're not having a sales tax holiday this weekend? So what happened in this legislative session is they set the state sales tax at 4.45 and then they said here's a list of the exemptions that you can take and there are 109 of them and if you're not in that list then that exemption is going to be suspended as long as this law is enforced. Well the sales tax holidays weren't on the list. So is it good or bad tax policy to have a weekend where the state's not collecting sales tax? I think sometimes people fool themselves a little bit uh, into thinking, oh, I'm getting a better deal. Well, you don't know what that sale would have been or whether that sale would have been a steeper sale discount than it was that weekend. It's really, really hard to know. Um, but as far as tax policy, the problem is it, it, the more exemptions you have that, you, that, you, that, that really are not uh, really unnecessary, then the more pressure there is to have a higher rate on your, on your sales tax rate. And that's really what it's all about. There are kind of some bigger issues with Louisiana's sales tax system. Uh, our, our whole sales tax system uh, is, is one of the worst in the country. And that's partly because of the, the huge number of exemptions. It's partly because of the lack of uniformity and what amounts we place on each one, the difference between the local rate and the state rate and what we apply those to, and also the very decentralized collection system that we have here. Louisiana is unusual in that the, the local governments uh, are really in charge of the, of the sales tax uh, collection. Also at the tail end of the session, we as lawmakers were kind of running around trying to decide how much money they needed to raise, the U.S. Supreme Court came out with a decision. What happened is known as the Wayfair decision. It went to court with South Dakota and tried to, to determine you know, uh, whether or not sales taxes could be collected there, even if they didn't have a physical presence in South Dakota. So what the Wayfair decision did by the Supreme Court was to say, it doesn't have to be you know, just a, a physical presence for you to collect your sales tax. You know, if, if you have a, virtual, a substantial virtual presence, that can be enough. So these two things that you mentioned, the locals and the state taxing different things and the locals being more of the authority in collection are, right, are right. two policies that set Louisiana back. The uh, Supreme Court decision said that, well, we like South Dakota's centralized system. And that's one of the reasons we think the South Dakota system does not violate the U.S. Constitution Commerce Clause. It's not placing uh, an undue burden on businesses to do interstate commerce. <laughs> well, Louisiana doesn't have a centralized system. So what it's done is to create a remote uh, sales tax commission that will be in charge of being the central collector for a lot of these remote sales. The local governments are already moving ahead to make the collections. The Remote Sales Commission is trying to get its ducks in a row and get up and get started and start to do it at the beginning of 2019. Um, the big question is, in the end, uh, how 
are those taxes really going to be collected and in what circumstances are they going to be collected? Somebody's going to sue, all this is going to go to court and, and, and I think that's what our organization has been saying for a while is that we see this kind of collision course coming. We should also explain that there's not necessarily this big uncollected pile of tax revenue out there. What you have to realize is that a lot of the big online sales into the state, we're already collecting sales tax on it. So they're already in the books, so to speak, as, 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 far, as far as that. Now you have a whole new realm of uh, retailers, especially those who are the e-commerce type place. So those will start your paying Etsy's the, and the your set, Etsy's. Your Etsy's, your, yeah, your eBay's, that type of thing. So there will be new revenue as a result of this. There's, there's no question there's more revenue there, but a lot of the, the biggest retailers out there that are already selling in the state we're already collecting. So you're not going to see an enormous leap up of, of, of money. All right. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today, Always Robert. good to talk <laughs> to you. Yeah, good luck. Hurricane experts at Colorado State University now predict the remainder of this year's Atlantic hurricane season will be below average. They cite a cooler Atlantic Ocean and vertical wind shear as reasons. They predict nine more storms, there have been three already remember, three reaching hurricane strength, one being major, with a 19% chance a major storm will strike along our Gulf Coast. Any talk of hurricanes offers little comfort for those of us living in Louisiana. Long before Katrina became the benchmark, 162 years ago this month, there was the last island hurricane. It permanently wiped out what had become the place to summer along our coast. I talked with state climatologist Barry Keim about that tragic event. In the 1850s, a visitor described this stretch of sand and surf. He wrote, This beach is certainly one of the finest places for promenading I have ever seen. In that era, Louisiana was one of the wealthiest states in America. Here on Ile Dernier, about five miles from the mainland, on the Gulf Coast of Terrebonne Parish, this paradise had become a fashionable beach resort for Louisiana's plantation owners and the well-to-do of New Orleans. On the weekend of August 9th and 10th, 1856, about 400 people packed the 100 or so structures on the island. The main hotel, with its ballroom, dancing, restaurant, and fineries, was the focal point. Few had given thought about the dangers of summering on a remote barrier island during hurricane season. Unaware of how vulnerable that they were. It was a beach resort, and uh, it was a little bit off the coast. I mean. It's hard to go to the beach in the marsh of Louisiana. So this was one place, you're, you're off the marsh, you're a few miles off the coastline, and the water's a little fresher, a little cleaner. Friday night, August 8th, the weather began to turn. It worsened Saturday with the full impact Sunday the 10th. In 1856, there's no real warning that you know a storm is coming. Forecasting was essentially non-existent then and, uh, and basically we have the storm that gins up uh, in the extreme southeastern uh, Gulf of Mexico. It, uh, the first ship reports of this storm were is about a hundred or so miles west of Key West. My suspicion is it probably moved out over what's called the loop current. The loop current is this very warm water current that comes up out of the Caribbean and goes into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, and then these eddies break off and kind of spin out over the, over the Gulf. My guess is that storm probably got out of one of those eddies, exploded in its intensity because you have all this energy feeding into the storm. Uh, by the way, Katrina and Rita did that in 2005 as well. I assume this storm did something very similar, and then uh, ended up making landfall at the, you know, the Isle Denier uh, at Category 4 strength, but winds close to 150 miles per hour. Think of the, of the reaction uh, that had to have existed for something to go from something so grand to non-existent pretty much overnight. About a 11 or 12 foot storm surge rolled over this island. Keep in mind the highest point on the island is only six or seven feet. So every point on the island was underwater, at least you know five or six feet of water in most places much deeper. W.W. Pugh, a wealthy planter from Assumption Parish and survivor, 
wrote this about that Sunday afternoon. Now the struggle for life commenced and horror was painted on every face. All caught without shelter or something to hold on to fell victims to the merciless waters. That was the signature storm for Louisiana uh, in the, through the, you know, the latter part of the 1800s, all the way up until the Chenier Commandata storm hit in 1893. The next morning, dazed survivors wandered Ile de Nair, surrounded by dead. One recalled, the jeweled and lily hand of a woman was seen protruding from the sand. The New Orleans Daily Picayune printed this account. Houses began to slide and crumble. The hotel began to sway. Then, with the first tremendous gust of wind, one tremendous cry of agony went up, and in five minutes, naught was to be heard but the howling of the winds and the lashing of the waters. It's believed more than 320 people died. Not one structure, not even a foundation, was left standing. The island, split in two by the storm, was never inhabited again. You don't want to believe these kinds of storms can happen, but when they do, yeah, you just have to say, okay, this, this can't happen. This is what we need to be prepared for in the future. You know, one of those things in Louisiana that we've had to cope with since they founded New Orleans in 1718, uh, coping with storm after storm after storm. And you know, once they happen, and you know they can happen, uh, brace yourself because something else is gonna, is right around the corner. Today, what remains of Last Island forms the Ile de Nier chain, five islands, three of which make up the Terrebonne Barrier Islands Refuge, which is home to nesting water birds. And that is our show for this week, everyone. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks so much for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.